Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vladimir Ladegian, and I'm from California Institute of Technology. So first, I want to thank NERSC for having me here presenting. Thank DOE for finding my research. Uh, thank Caltech for providing me an advisor, Brent Fultz, a great advisor. And uh, thank Oak Ridge National Laboratory, who helped us with experimental data. And today, I'll be talking about and harmonic effects in hexagonal zinc, diffuse features, in particular diffuse features and its temperature dependence of the phonon spectra. So quick agenda. So I'll be talking, our group focus is finding like new fundamental properties of vibrations in materials. So first I start with the background, what phenomena do we study in our group and what do we search for? And then mainly focus on what uh, do we use NERSC for? Uh, my computational methods, and they are divided on how we use DFT to support phonon calculations for temperature dependent effective potential and for molecular dynamics simulations that uh, is used for outer correlation function analysis. So, in our group, we are focused on, on lattice dynamics of materials, and particularly how atoms in materials are vibrate. Oh, so it's stuck. So this is characterized by phonons, which have particular frequency and a lifetime. And from there, we can get an effect at high temperatures, such as phase stability, thermal expansion, thermal properties, etc. effects which I would talk about today. So let's distinguish when, when I call like unharmonic, what do I mean to? The harmonic model is when we expand the potential energy surface up to a second order. But the unharmonic terms is when we expect out of the third order and so on. So there are also two different treatments when we treat uh, atomic vibrations as a function only on volume. This is a quasi-harmonic treatment and unharmonic when we treat it also depend on volume and temperature. So, and the effect I would be talking today is based on phonon-phonon coupling. So in particular interactions between the phonon and from a quantum optics, uh, this effect um, leads to formation of two additional modes uh, apart from the main mode, which result from the sum of frequencies and the difference of frequencies. To have an analogy from an optics, if you have an input of two frequencies, we get an output of two frequencies, and we have a nonlinear medium, we have a frequency doubling, a frequency sum, and the frequency difference. But not to be confused, in our case, it's not nonlinear optics. We don't have infinite lifetime quasi-particles. We don't have a distinct energy spectra. Usually we have something really broad, and we have a lot of vibrations at the same time, which are finitely lived during itself. So there rise additional frequencies, which sometimes are some of the frequencies of the harmonic modes and the difference of the frequencies, which is presented on the right. So how we do this experimentally? Experimentally, we go to the wide angular range chopper spectrometer to do inelastic neutron scattering experiment and obtain intensity, or it's called also a dynamical structure factor, which is intensity as a function of momentum transfer and energy transfer. And we do this experiment on the single crystals, which I seem to have almost ideal crystal structure. So from this, we obtain this dispersion curve, which are basically uh, the phonon spectrum as a function of momentum transfer along some high symmetry directions at different temperature. And what, what I want to emphasize here, that there are usual dispersions that are show at 15K and 300K, but we have an additional diffuse scattering at, at high temperatures at 500K and 690K, which we attribute to phonon-phonon interactions. So if we see the Q cuts, which is particular cuts along this nice picture, we would see that there are also additional peak, the intensity of which rises the temperature. So finally, we, we move, how do we support our calculation with NERSC resources? So we mainly do VASP calculations, mainly density functional theory calculations. And it appeared that for zinc, for some reason, it required a really high density more than 10 per inverse angstrom or 7, 7 by 7 for 64 atom supercell. 
And MPI CPU very, takes too long or takes too much nodes to compute. So great that we have NERSC and we have a GPU DFT calculations that greatly reduce this cost and allows us to construct a data set to perform a point calculations and so on. But the other topic of my work is utilizing machine learning potentials, which is basically fitting some atomic environment uh, with a flexible functional form to obtain a representation of energy forces and stresses. So in my case, there are a lot of options available, but I use moment tensor potential because of the trade-off in terms of accuracy and uh, computational cost, and mainly because I was a part of the development group of this potential. So, <laughs> So uh, I move like the, what also good about MPP is that it has an active learning, so you don't have to explicitly construct a data set. You can run NMD simulations, actively select from those configurations and update your training set self consistently. And I've moved this procedure to the NERSC and I moved this procedure to the NERSC and it works greatly. So, the second tr computational trouble we faced is that actually we want to compute not some approximation of the phonon spectra, but actual dynamical structure factor with nearly DFT accuracy. So it's like a four dimensional data set, but for that we need to compute this mode projected velocity autocorrelation function, which is basically transformed from the real space to the reciprocal space. But this label is better searched in Google. So, but because we have to do this 3D Fourier transform, the number of atoms in the system we need is number of Q points we want to resolve cubed. And this results that we need to perform large scale molecular dynamic simulations 10 to the fifth atoms usually and 10 picoseconds, but not to be confused, 10 picoseconds is only a single trajectory, but we needed 20 of those for, for statistical convergence. And because of this classic, because of these quantum molecular dynamic simulations are not applicable anymore, and, but we have classical molecular dynamic simulations with machine learning and atomic potentials, which we use. So after, after, after doing this, there is another problem that arises that actually such data sets of 10 to the fifth number of atoms and, uh, and a lot of picoseconds, it's a terabytes of MD data that needs to be post-processed. And when we do these free transforms, it appeared that IO is actually a big problem. It constitutes almost 70% of the computational time if we do it in raw formats. And the reduction five is reduction is only 25% and other stuff such as autocorrelation function, time free transform is only 5%. But luckily we found out that there is H5 MD format for lamps that uh, allows to dump lumps trajectories into HDF5, and we implement a software based on those that could paralyze IO reading. Uh, and utilizing that, we reduced the computational time by the order of magnitudes. And also, with the help of NERSC, we <coughs> also ported this stuff on GPUs if the reduction time takes too long. So, Finally, what we obtained from those is the figure on the right, and this greatly reproduces the diffuse intensity which we observe in the experiment. But there is, what if we want to actually find out which phonon phonon interaction contributes to the formation of this additional diffuse intensity? For this, we can use the technique called temperature dependent effective potential, which is sort of vanilla machine learning technique where we fit uh, a third order and high Hamiltonian uh, with some uh, spatial cutoff and fit the third order force constants, so then that can be transferred to three phonon interactions. And what is interesting about this stuff that theoretically you can derive that from these third order interactions you can obtain uh, the elements that contribute to the sum of frequencies and the difference of frequencies. And because the sum is linear, we can actually separate contributions and find out which stuff, oh, which stuff contributes to a particular region the most. So we do those. So we separated these contributions, check what is the weight to the final line shape of the particular Q cut. And 
we see here that there is like a particular regions of the dispersion curve that contribute to this diffuse intensity at high energies. But because we also have to conserve momentum, we can find the actual space that result in this interaction by, uh, by some of the energies. Thank you for your attention. On slide 15. Okay. You're showing, so this is, so can you explain again the difference between these two? Oh, this is experimental data. Oh, I see. Okay. And so the attempt was to basically, like it's a phenomenal, phenomenological question, right? You're trying to reproduce this with. Theory. Yeah. Yeah. Because like in theory, in theory, <laughs> if we have like this MD uh, represented phonons, like phonons compute from MD trajectories, uh, from outer correlation functions, they should include like all orders of unharmonicity up to like infinite order. As I've shown, like for, for example, like for this temperature dependent effective potential, it's only a third order. But the outer correlation function, because it contains like these exponents, it like represents up to an infinite order. So it represents all correlations in the material. Yeah, sure. Uh, just a similar question. How many atoms are in the primitive cell, the hexagonal cell? It's like two. Just two. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Um, so before you switch to HDF5, what sort of file format were you using? Uh, typically, there are like not that many options. You either use binary or like, like for example, this code, like called dinosaur, which is like the only one almost existing on the market. It uses CSV format. Okay, so yeah, from CSV to HDF5, that makes sense. I mean, like, it was not the problem actually in HDF5 format. It's like, the benefit was that, like, you have like HDF5, that it, then you have to write like a script to do a parallelized reading. So you just like parallelized reading of this like large scale trajectory. So you have like, 124 cores, each one is written like 128th part of the trajectory and reduces it. So you're using the feature in HDF5 that lets you have multiple MPI processes on the same file? Assessing the same file, yeah. Cool, cool. All right, thanks. Yeah, and it's also like great that you can actually use, use the same stuff on GPU nodes, so you can like use like eight GPU cores with a single, like each single core reading like one eighth part and reducing it. So it also works there. See, there's a question in the Q and A, so. Okay, the question is, does the number of atoms in the simulation have a major impact on the accuracy of the result? Um, the number of atoms in the simulation like affects how many Q points you would be resolving. If you, uh, if you can, like, if you, uh, uh, yeah, if we, if you like can, if you can see this picture in the details, uh, there are like some jumps of like between the Q cuts. But the more number of atoms you have, the more Q points you can resolve. Like if you if you have two small cell, you would have like two or three of these Q points that wouldn't represent like the full phonon behavior. You can interpolate between those, but if you have like not enough, like not at least like a thousand or like ten thousand, you wouldn't it wouldn't allow you like you wouldn't have like points to interpolate with between. Thank you.